My name is Shanaika Farias. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union. And it is such a privilege uh, to be here with you all in my hometown, um, see so many familiar faces uh, to be able to have this conversation. So just a little background, we've been doing these series called Serving the Whole Child. And the purpose of that, uh, we've been able to cover healthcare, um, food security, and now we're talking about housing. And part of that is because from personal experience for a lot of us, um, understanding that a lot of times we expect a child to walk in the school doors and just forget about everything else they're experimenting, they're experiencing throughout their life. And when we think about housing, when we think about healthcare, when we think about food, those are all basic needs of a human being. And our children, our students, our young people are no different from that. So this, today, this conversation is happening in New London. New London is no different than Hartford. It's no different than Bridgeport. It's no different than New Haven, who's also experiencing all of these conversations about housing. Yes, we talk about affordable housing, but what about safe housing, right? Because it's not just about it being affordable. It's not great for the, the individuals living there if it's not safe. And a little bit about my story. My family migrated here in 2010 after a major earthquake back in my hometown, my home state, my home country in Haiti. And I understand firsthand to see your country, your home fall apart, literally in pieces. And this is not a story that I like to talk about. But my family moved here in the States to be able to have good housing. The sad part about that is it wasn't until I went to college that I realized that I actually haven't been living in safe housing. My family had access to housing. We had affordable housing. But when I left that place, actually when I was leaving the Huntington Apartments, I never even wanted to step foot back there again. Not to take a picture, not to even look at it, sometimes not to even drive by, by it. The first time we moved there, I was excited. Yes, first time, our first home to be able to live in a place by ourselves. But little did I know it would start to feel like I was in prison. Not enough windows, mouse infestations, and nobody cares. It wasn't about two years ago I was able with the help of my community and the people who have invested in me in this town to become the first time homeowner and first in my family. <laughs> and sometimes people will see that. They'll be like, she's so lucky. But little did they know, like my family was on the verge of being homeless, right? And that's unfortunately the stories of many people. You might know someone. You might know a colleague, it might be you. So while I was fortunate enough to experience what it's like to have safe housing for the first time in my life, I know a lot of people that's not their story. We had a presentation by the um, superintendent of school when I was attending the budget hearing a few weeks ago and the data broke my heart. Over 300 students in New London right now in our hometown are currently houseless. 300 students. And they might not be high school students. You're thinking probably a 16 year old, a 18 year old, but in reality, it's probably an elementary school student who their family and their parents just haven't been able to find shelter. And if they have, it hasn't been safe. So thank you for joining this conversation with us tonight. These are some amazing panelists who have stories of their own, of how they have been impacted by housing. And I encourage you to join this conversation with us as when they're finished talking, we'll pass the mic to ask questions uh, because that's an issue that's really important to us. And this partnership with Connecticut Public for Connecticut black and brown students have been such an amazing opportunity 
to be able to discuss these conversations that are too close to home. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Isn't she great? <laughs> uh, I'm Lucy Nopithanchel with Connecticut Public, which is our statewide NPR PBS station. And, and Shine and I started talking last summer about uh, partnering on a series. And so we're, we were so happy to be able to spend time talking about the social determinants that impact a child's success. And we know that also impacts their families, their communities. Uh, in November, we talked about um, access to quality health care in New Haven. Uh, in February, we talked about access to healthy, fresh food. And that conversation was in Hartford. So we're really happy to be here in New London with all of you. Thank you for coming. And thank you for the Guard Arts Center for hosting this conversation tonight. So I also want to thank the Graustein Memorial Fund for supporting this series, Serving the Whole Child. So I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, and we'll have a bit of a conversation learning about their work. And then around 7.40, 7.45, we'd love for you to join in on the conversation. We'll have a, a microphone that will be passed around for your questions or comments to our panelists. So I want to introduce first Errol Maurice, who serves the Southeastern Connecticut community as the Housing Counseling Agency Coordinator under the New London Homeless Hospitality Center. His career in Connecticut spans 25 years working with adjudicated youth, young adults, and adults with severe and persistent mental illness, as well as in residential housing and chronic homelessness programs. Errol, it sounds like Connecticut's lucky to have you. Sitting next to Errol is Margaret Lancaster, Senior Health Program Coordinator, Peer Navigator, and Community Health Worker at Ledge Light Health District in New London, Connecticut. Since she joined the Health District in 2020, Margaret has been a leading team member of New London County Cares and served as the team coordinator for the Overdose to Action Grant Program. And as a person with lived experience, Margaret is committed to serving and supporting community members and working with families that are currently unhoused by linking them to services and resources needed to sustain housing or locate safe and affordable housing in the community. Thank you, Margaret, for joining us. Shonda Easley, sitting next to Margaret, is a program manager with Thames River Community Service, which has a mission to provide safe housing with support services through permanent housing and through a transitional living program where formerly homeless families are committed to developing healthy relationships. Thames has the only youth transitional housing program in Connecticut serving families with parenting youth from 18 to 24 years of age. Shonda and her team members also provide youth rapid rehousing and short-term crisis housing for young people. And I understand there are six programs under its umbrella. Five of those programs are focused on 18 to 24-year-olds. Shonda, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> and last but not least, my colleague Sabrina Buckwalter is the story producer for Fighting for Home. This is an upcoming documentary by Connecticut Public premiering June 27th on CPTV. It will explore segregation and disparity in the state's housing crisis. For the past 12 years, Sabrina has worked on various documentaries that all examine the abuse of power in a multitude of ways. Sabrina, thank you for coming tonight. So I'll ask all of you to pick up your microphones and we'll start the conversation. I wanted to start uh, tonight um, reading this statistic that I found pretty troubling, that Connecticut lacks about 93,000 units of housing that are affordable and available to its lowest income renters. That's according to the state's Housing Finance Authority. The Connecticut Mirror reported that there are a number of reasons for this demand that a lot of communities are seeing. We know rent costs are rising. Homelessness has increased. The inventory of homes for sales has hit historic lows. And thousands are paying more than a third of their income to housing costs. And we know in Connecticut especially, restrictive local zoning regulations make it hard to build enough multifamily housing. So I wanted to hear from each of you about how your organizations are seeing these stats play out in southeastern Connecticut. Errol, I'll start with you. 
Okay, absolutely. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let me shout out actually Kathy Zoll, who's in the crowd tonight. Let's, let's give her a nice little round of applause. She is a major champion uh, around homelessness in this region uh, at the Housing Counseling Agency. Uh, our focus is more so around education. Uh, it's taking a proactive measure around combating homelessness, uh, once again, through education. Uh, we do renter education in the community, uh, landlord education, uh, foreclosure mitigation. Uh, we do senior supports at our local senior centers. Uh, we do first-time homeowner workshops on the second Saturday of every month. Uh, if anything, kind of really reviewing the steps from looking at a home all the way to the closing, uh, providing that education for community members. Uh, in addition, we are a hub uh, in this region for Unite CT, which assists community members with eviction prevention funds and uh, mortgage assistance program, no, moving assistance program rather, which is MAP funding, which provides uh, security deposits for those uh, who are looking for security deposits that are chron chronically homeless and or they're facing eviction uh, in which a renter or a landlord no longer wants to work with that a particular tenant. Um, you know, we, Noreen Zupnik, who's in the house as well tonight, uh, who focuses on senior supports. She is a wonderful, wonderful asset to our program. Uh, but once again, we do education in the community, just kind of really getting the word out in terms of what we do, what we can provide, and just resources that are in the community available to folks. And that education is important, but are you seeing increased demand to get connected to these services? Absolutely. Um, if anything, we are seeing a huge demand currently in Groton, Connecticut. Uh, if anything, Ivy Court, you've seen it in the news, you've seen it in the newspapers. Uh, folks from Fieldside, if anything, the, uh, the mobile homes that I believe it's called High Rock Point, uh, we're seeing a lot of folks who are currently being evicted. We are seeing exorbitant rents. Um, we, we are seeing a little bit of everything. We're, you know, assisting those folks with education. We're assisting them with their fair, fair rent commission cases and their fair housing complaints as well. Shonda, I mentioned that Thames uh, really focuses on uh, services for young people. And so, what kind of demand are you seeing? Um, well, our demand is has been pretty much stable throughout. I mean, we've seen more or less um, not being able to house because the rents are so high. They're 18, 19, 20 years old, even working a full-time job, and minimum wage isn't going to get them housing at no point in trying to get an apartment. So it, that has just been our biggest struggle, is just trying to find a way to be able to house them safely um, with the cost of rents. So that's been more or less instilled as a challenge. How much does it cost? What's the average rent in southeastern Connecticut? <laughs> It all depends on where you stand, I'd say. Um, uh, I believe, like, right now, we just rented a one-bedroom $1,200. Um, so where is someone going to live for $1,200 where they're working full-time trying to pay the $1,200 rent for a one-bedroom that was $800 three years ago, right? So it's just, the, and it got to the point to where even Section 8 had to increase their FMR for their voucher holders because they couldn't find affordable housing with their vouchers because the amounts were too low, so. So where do you point people for finding housing then? It's a struggle, it's a daily struggle. Um, so basically shelter stays are longer because we can't get no one in and out of shelters as quickly as we were. Transitional housing numbers are longer because we can't house no one quicker because of the cost of housing. So um, we just have to get creative in our approach. You know, we try to do, you know, shared housing if we can, as much as we can do shared housing. We try to do, you know, well, they give back with their immediate between their parent, like their their relatives or something of that nature. Anything that we can do to try to be creative and being able to house them as much as we could to provide the supports. But it's a daily struggle. Margaret, I see you nodding your head to everything your colleagues are saying up here. When we talk about someone who is struggling to find housing or who is unhoused, can we talk about the definition and, and how that definition impacts how a person is connected to services to begin with? Well, how it has a definition um, of what homelessness is, um, I myself will look at it in a sense where um, anyone who at has not have housing that is safe and affordable and not having some place to stay where they can um, cook, um, bathe, and take care of the essential needs as an individual and a human being. Um, I work with a lot of individual families now 
getting calls to the health department, um, speaking of social determinants of health, uh, we look at that, um, what the, the table looks like. Every criteria that falls under there, every person I work with falls under each one of the categories from the social determinants of health. I have families that have been living in a hotel with four or five children in one bedroom, have income, enough income to sustain an apartment, but they don't have a credit score that will fit the criteria of the landlord, or they may not have um, the um, housing, history. housing history, thank you, Sean, um, that would reflect what is needed. One eviction will turn a landlord away. So if a family who now is living in a hotel for a year, you have to remember what happens to the impact of that child. Um, developmental behavior, their um, emotional stability, um, learning changes, the social relationship absolutely changes with, I can't have my friends over to play. You know, those are the things that we have to think of. And this is, could be ongoing. It might not be the first go around being houseless or homeless because of what we've seen happen to the housing market, the way we see landlords uh, buying up properties in communities that had one time, at one time, sustained families over many, many years. And that we see people being moved out of in neighborhoods um, where now development is happening and there's no longer families that could afford that place at one time, um, being able to be um, there or they have to relocate to a whole nother town where all the supports are in the town that they've been in for maybe 10 years. When you talk about the development that's happening, who is that development for? Not for the families we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, EB. EB. The mayor says all the time. Oh, sorry. The yeah, all the time. <laughs> EB, EB. The mayor says all the time. And I can tell you right now, there's an, I've got eight young adults that are got entry level jobs over at EB. Can nobody they cannot afford the apartments that he keeps talking about. So I'm just mm -hmm. put that out there. So yeah, I, I asked him to please change his slogan to you know experience EB workers. So because mm -hmm. can, then none of them can afford the apartments that are going up that is supposed to be targeting for them. And for our audience at home, EB is electric boat. Yep. Sabrina, you've been, we're talking a lot about what we're seeing in southeastern Connecticut, but you have been reporting on this housing crisis statewide. And so when you hear Margaret and Shonda and Errol talking about the need, is that what you're hearing in many communities across our state? It's completely what I'm hearing, and I feel like every single anecdote that I'm hearing is what we're trying to cover in the documentary, because how powerful is it to actually see these stories in front of your face? You feel these stories, you feel the people, you feel their emotion, you see the struggle that they're going through, and that's... You know that that's the beauty of storytelling is that you can really move people to action, and so all of these things are things that we we're seeing. Um, we follow about four families um, who are all going through some form of housing insecurity. One family in particular comes to mind: the Sanchez family from Norwalk, and uh, they were evicted during the pandemic, despite the moratorium, and they have hit. Uh, bad news every step of the way, and they lived in their car, uh, their suburban, for six months. Family of four, high schooler, and a third grader. And they spent their first night in a McDonald's parking lot. And they proceeded to do this for six months. So we, we see them at the shelter. Eventually, after six months, they got housing at Inspirica Shelter in Stanford. And so we see this um, process with them about how they go, um, you know, wait for housing, wait for that voucher, which is, which is difficult. But it's one example of the difficulty um, that families and folks experience here um, in Connecticut, and especially getting to see what it's like for the kids is really important. And as Shine mentioned earlier, how can we expect a child to be ready to go to school and learn 
when they're dealing with all of these other things in the home. It's a lot for adults to shoulder, let alone children. The documentary is called Fighting for Home. That title is very intentional. Can you tell us why it was chosen? Yeah, I mean, fighting for home is something that I think f uh, probably everybody in common or everybody in our, our film has this in common that they're fighting for it. You shouldn't have to fight for it, you know, and, and I think that's the irony of this situation is that it is a fight. And one of the other families and folks that we follow is at Coleman Towers in Sanford. So this is an example where we have an investor who's come in and bought a building, kicked everyone out, mm -hmm. said, you can come back, um, but it's going to be higher rent. And what we see in the situation is them fighting and fighting hard. And it's hard because they're mostly elderly. And fighting for them means when their building is going through renovations and you have the elevators that are out of service for days on end and you have somebody on the eighth floor who has to go to a doctor's appointment and can't walk down those eight flights of stairs, they have to call a fire truck or an ambulance to get down. Technically, I think it was a fire truck they called, but the point is, is that you see that kind of fight, you see that kind of struggle for you know, their, their home, their livelihood. A lot of these people have lived there for 20, 30 years. They've raised kids there and to be, they also owned it. It's a co-op building. So that was the most heartbreaking point of it all is that you have all of these folks who all own their units and have been kicked out. There's more to the story. And, and if you get a chance to watch the documentary, you'll see it, but it's, this particular story is very much about the fight for housing. Uh, Margaret, um, when we talk about storytelling, we know that when we talk with people with lived experience, it can be more impactful and powerful because there's a connection, right? We wouldn't want that to happen to ourselves, people in our lives. You have lived experience, and so how does that inform the work that you're doing at Ledgelight? Um, well, it actually, pushed me into the work at Ledger Light. Um, I've been working in the field of um, social services and community health work. I could say it's service work, no matter how it's calling. Um, for the past 19 years, I, at 38 years old, I found myself homeless living in my car. Um, I worked at EB for many years. Prior to that, I worked at Pfizer. Um, I'm a New London native. Um, lived here most of my life, left for a little bit, and I, I came back to do the work that I'm doing today. Um, how does it impact me? Well, I have to give back what was freely given to me, and that's the opportunity to have resources and connections with people who cared enough about my situation. Have, a, have groups of um, individuals that are, are dedicated to the cause, truly to the cause of having people have safe, affordable, and sustainable housing in our community. I worked across the state and was able to get there a lot of information from other cities and the best thing about that was I was able to bring that information back to my hometown. I worked in Hartford and Bridgeport, New Haven, working in homelessness and substance use disorder and mental health. I have my green on day today for a reason. Um, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and I'm going to say it loud. <laughs> and I'm going to represent my peers and myself today in that, in that way. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's giving me the opportunity to embrace um, what I've been able to come out of. I'm a homeowner today myself, um, and I have a long legacy of um, um, in, um, st something that's been poured into me from my father, I'll say that. And it was sitting there dormant for a very long time. I think I had experienced some of this to get where I am today, and it gives me more drive to help the families um, and the people, and my, I call them still my peers, that are still struggling with house, houselessness and homelessness today. Uh, fighting for housing rights is in your blood because your father, Spencer Lancaster, one of the first uh, elected officials, a black man in New London, one of the first to be elected. Yeah. And he worked to integrate what was once a formerly all white um, housing complex. It's a, a powerful legacy that you carry on. I, I call it a mantle. <laughs> it's like it was kind of passed down to me. Unknowing, unbeknownst to myself, and, and I'm just going to continue to carry it, carry it on. So we're, we're setting the scene or talking about what 
each of you is seeing or hearing. But what are the solutions? And I'll start with you, Shonda, because tonight we're speaking, yeah, <laughs> we're speaking the same night that the legislative session will be ending. And so the question is always, what are lawmakers doing to respond to the needs of our communities? So Shonda, what are some solutions that you see that state elected officials uh, should be offering? Oh. <laughs> That's a big question. I think solutions aren't cookie cutter, and I think that's part of the struggle when you talk about programs and supports. Like, you have to fit this box to be able to get this. You have to fit this box to get that. Um, flexibility is something that I think that we've all tried to push across the board in terms of funding and support, because not everybody can check that eligibility box for all these five things. So if you, ain't got all, you don't have all these four or five things, you can't get this help. Or you may have two of the five, you can't get this. So it's like, that's something that, I, you know, flexibility is something that um, is definitely needed. I know when we all spoke and we all wrote our letters, so that's, that's something we wanted to emphasize was flexibility. Errol? Mic check, mic check. <laughs> I would like to jump in real quick. If anything, uh, just really touching upon fair market rent. I mean, if anything, it's just most, mostly a mere suggestion, really, at this point. If you really can't do anything with it, uh, there are folks who are living in dwellings that are paying $1,800 for a one-bedroom apartment. Fair market rent for a one-bedroom is currently around $1,200 in southeastern Connecticut. Uh, politicians need to start maybe potentially talking about capping rent. Um, that is a potential solution uh, that I believe will help you know, folks in Connecticut communities and probably all over the nation. Is that something that has been brought to the attention of yeah. lawmakers, and who who has responded, if at all? There have been talks, um, you know, our state representatives and you know the Department of Housing. Uh, however, I mean, there is the other side to the coin, which is the opportunity for free enterprise. Uh, investors are coming in here; they they're, they don't have a connection to the community. They're coming from New Jersey. They're coming from New York, and you know they want to make money. They're investing not to say, "Hey, look, I want to provide a wonderful community for folks." I'm investing in another state because I want to provide for my family. So that's really something to think about. But yeah, our politicians, they're the ones, they're our lawmakers. They need to come together and kind of really solve, come with a solution that benefits the people of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's taken them three years just to put out a legislation about you can't evict someone because you have a lapse in your lease. I mean, that should be something that most states already have. Like, you know, I don't renew my lease. They, I, I can I can kick you out, and it's not because I did anything wrong. It's because I just don't I landlord. I don't want to renew your lease, so you gotta go. So those are the th those are the things that they've talked about doing the the pandemic that came out of all of the funding that they quote unquote claim they lost was renewing leases, evictions, and like I was talking about capping rent. But it's also a business, so they also need the tax dollars and the other side of it. So I think that. Um, What's the point? Where's the purpose of having a fair market rent if it's not going to be regulated through no one? But I think the towns are also responsible for that too. Um, I get it with the politicians, but your town has a right to say to you know, they can also at these zoning meetings and things of that nature. They want to come develop. I think they also have to have accountability as well because. You come in, and that's great. You want to come in and build in this building. You're going to charge this much. You're driving your families away, and then to what that leaves your community, your schools, and all this, because no family can live in that particular part of town or area because they can't afford it. So I also think it's a responsibility also is on a town who approve all of these uh, buildings to be built and things of that nature. So I also think there's a responsibility on both ends between um, both entities. Sabrina, can we talk more about accountability? So we know in recent years there's been a lot of talk about the housing crisis and local control not wanting to be taken away and whether it's a carrot and a stick <laughs> <laughs> approach from the governor's office on down. So, so what is the status here in terms of making any headway to what we're hearing about, right? So there yeah. are families that are living in a McDonald's parking lot. Right, right, right. Yeah, so all of this talk about accountability is something that um, I think is very important. I'll give one tiny example with Coleman that I talked about earlier. Accountability in this situation could have meant something as fairly simple as due diligence because if the Board of Representatives had 
ensured that the promises were made, um, ensured that, uh, you know, basically all the rules were followed, we would have avoided almost the entire situation of, you know, near homelessness for some of these folks. Um, but when it comes down to, you know, what are we doing? How are we going to solve this? What, what, what needs to be fixed? I do want to focus on zoning because zoning is, you just keep coming back to it time and time and time again in terms of why we can't build more affordable housing, why we can't even just build multifamily housing. The problem is zoning. But below that, what is the real problem behind zoning? Uh, it's because folks are biased. Folks are just plain racist. And it just, it needs to be said. And that's the root of it. And it needs to be called out and it needs to be recognized, and it's difficult to um, really, it, 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 what has happened in Connecticut, and I think this is really important to understand, and this is what we talk about in the documentary, is that um, a lot of white folks have found that the way to talk about and to, the way to exclude is through um, economic means. So, so back in, 19, in the 1920s, when folks were not able to say, I don't want black and brown folks in my neighborhood, what they ended up finding out that they could say was, oh, well, let me actually say that this particular lot has to be really big so no one can afford it. And it just started this whole legacy of um, economic segregation, which is just, it's, it's basically just um, race-based segregation by another name. So, um, the point is, is that if you want to fix zoning, which is what we should do, you first have to fix the underlying problem. And how do you, how do you fix that mindset? Uh, and another mindset that um, when we talk about affordable housing, that that's only something that urban areas, that should only be in urban areas. But why? Correct. Why? Why is it only got to be in the urban areas? Um, that has been extremely frustrating to, to witness, to hear folks talk about, to hear folks advocate for, um, but it's very prevalent in Connecticut. Um, and so um, at least in the film, we get to call it out, we get to show it, we get to say, we get to bring awareness to it. So um, at least we hope with that bit, it can help It'll, it'll bring awareness and hopefully it'll bring some type of action. I hear some people um, making some comments. So I want, I think might be a good time to go to some audience comments and questions. So my colleague uh, Shannon from Connecticut Public has the microphone. So if you wanna raise your hand and when she comes to you, if you could just say your first name and what part of Connecticut you're from, or if you're representing an organization, we'd love to hear that too. Just a plug for public service, Beth Sebelia for the, from the Center for Housing Equity and Opportunity, Eastern Connecticut. If you're gonna change zoning, you need to change who's sitting in those seats. <laughs> so we need to have people of all um, communities step forward and say, we are pro homes, we need to see this change, and I'm gonna step up and run for office or seek appointment to planning and zoning or the Zoning Board of Appeals, or the Conservation Commission, or Inland Wetlands, because all of those are road stops. So get involved in your home communities, please. Excellent point. Thank you for saying that. There's a question in the back. If you could say your first name and what part of Connecticut you're from. Um, hello, my name is Jeremy, and I am here for hearing youth voices. <clears throat> My question is, if we're gonna do something about like the uh, um, affording like apartments and stuff, I wanna know like how we're gonna take those prices down, how we're gonna help these people that are homeless and need these apartments. Errol, did you wanna take that question? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, uh, ultimately, it starts with community conversations just like this. Um, 
you, you know, folks, you, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and if anything, this whole room has a wealth of information. Uh, in terms of, you know, bringing rents down and things of that nature, it starts with meeting with your local politicians, right? You, you need to know who you're voting for at the end of the day. Um, and having those conversations about, hey, look, the things that are important to you. You know, I'm a young adult. I'm assuming you're probably between 20 and 25. You know, I, I would love the opportunity to have my own place, but I can't afford my own place because fair market rent for a one bedroom is $1,200. I'm making minimum wage. You know, who is representing me? I'm voting for you. You're supposed to be representation for me. Uh, but it starts with having those conversations with uh, politicians, you know, community collaborations, uh, hearing you voices. Your office is actually is right next door to mine. Uh, you are more than welcome. I'm on 234 State Street. Anytime that you want to politic, have conversations. If I could advocate for you, I'd be happy to uh, meet with you. That's a really important point, Errol. When we look at the November elections, people get heated and they're engaged in national elections. But when it's time for municipal elections, no one shows up. So when you're voting for mayor, when you're voting for council, when you're voting for board of education, those elections matter. They're made up of people in your community and they should be responding to you. Uh, we have a question in the back. Um, Kathy, and I, I live in New London. I was just curious if you could touch on the issues of transportation, which do appear to put housing out of reach for many people in our region. And I was just curious, any thoughts about the connection between transportation and access to housing? Shonda or Margaret, do you want to take that? Well, as we know, we have a, a bus transit system here in, in our area, in New London County. Um, but even in that being said, the buses don't run as they should. Um, they are on their own time schedule. They're, it's not always feasible for everyone to get on the bus or meet the bus at the uh, designated areas that they, they are, are designed to be at. Um, at this time, um, if a person has uh, supports right in the community, especially with that being, or their doctor's appointments, medical appointments, they have to take two, three hour rides to sometimes get to the appointment if it's in New London, if they're now supported in our uh, housed in Norwich because there's no housing left in New London, let's move them to Norwich. And it takes them three hours to get down to maybe even a job that they've had in New London. Um, the other thing I wanna just touch on real quickly is the eviction process. You have to wait, I have to say this, you have to wait till you're in the eviction process to get help. I'm confused. Right? Okay, you have to wait. That's that flexibility I talk yeah. about. That makes, that's the flexibility I talk about. No, no pun. But that's the <laughs> you have to wait till you're in the eviction process. I'm working with, they had to wait till they were in the eviction process before they can get assistance mm -hmm. yes. to get for their housing, to be stabilized. So let, what, what, it, what do we do with that? That's what I think, bring those type of things to, because it's the courts, number one, right? Um, why, does it why does it have to be that before monies can be distributed to someone? Um, when you get a notice to quit, that's from the court as well. Um, you have to wait for that to happen first. That's because HUD views it as they're the most needed, right? So they feel like their dollars should go to the a population of people that need it the most. So if you have eviction notice, then you need it more than a person who is one month behind the rent. The landlord may like, oh, I'll help you. So they see it distortedly. Right. <laughs> so. Yes. And then change, change evictions as not a punitive measure of getting housing again. What, well, if you have an eviction, that's one of the things that a landlord will ask you. Do you have an eviction on your record? Yes, well, we can't rent to you. Well, I think it also starts with our housing authority and income-based mm -hmm. housing as well. I yep. mean, they are the state, they operate in the same manner. Yeah. Yep. So how can you ask private landlords to say, I will take you if the low-income entities yep. won't take Do you either? Yep. So how can someone apply for low-income housing and can't get it because I was evicted from an apartment I couldn't afford, so that's the whole reason why I applied for low-income housing. So it's the same cycle. So and that needs to be addressed across the board, and in my eyes, because I do think that that's you know, one of the stupidest things I've ever seen in my life. Like So the whole reason for applying for this is because I can't 
couldn't afford this. So right. um, I think that's something that need to be addressed as well. To your question, with your comment, um, Kathy, about transportation, I do feel like a trans in our area is horrible, and I do think more needs to be done to it. It's not enough attention. Like Hartford gets a lot of attention in terms of their transportation issues and they woes. I think the seat bus in our area needs more support in some in some fashion to be able to understand the needs and more support, I believe, from the community and the towns to be able to make it better. Because I think it can be better. It's just a matter of how can it be better. And I think they just need more people on their within their community of teams to be able to make that better. Errol? Uh, I'm going to step in again and uh, once again stress just collaborations and partnerships and the importance of that, right? Uh, you, you need integration. There are so many people that, that are in this field providing various services, yet we often operate in our own silos. That is part of the problem. You may have a expertise in certain, certain things that I do not. You know, and if anything, put, pulling our resources together for the citizens of Southeastern Connecticut is very, very essential. Talked about as a, as a youth team, a youth provider, us all getting together and then coming up with a proposal to talk to seat about how we can make this better because it's got to. We have to find a way to make it better because most of our population rely on the bus to get to work to do, to do anything. So, I th I feel like they want to try, but they're limited based on their capacity level. So I think. Um, that's something that's on my to-do list for this year is to approach the, their board and to try to feel how can what, what can we do to help this out because we need it just as badly as anybody else. Before we take another question or comment, there is a bill before the legislature that's been voted on. It's called Work, Live, Ride. And so that would give priority to funding if towns build multifamily or apartments that's also along the public transit line. Did I get it right, Sabrina? You did, yep. Yep. Yeah, and that's actually, they passed the House and they went in front of this, I believe they went, well, they would have gone in front of Senate, I believe, today. I know I just got an email um, yesterday or this morning. So with Work Live Right, that's um, a really great bill. It's one one part of, you know, one, one small solution to everything, but I think that um, that's kind of how our legislature is sort of tackling this issue, right? It's it's sort of by piecemeal. It's little tiny things that keep chipping away at the greater problem, which um, I'm not not necessarily a big fan of. But you know, even when we've talked to you know um, Representative Rojas, for example, he recognizes and he has stated the fact that well, this is how really we're going to get anything done because people are so um, averse to change. But this particular bill is. Uh, does seem to be like it's headed in a good direction. I should have checked it before I came, but let's see. Towns would still have the opportunity to opt in. There is no mandate from the state. No mandate. Yeah. Um, that's one of the problems that, that housing advocates recognize is that with all of these, um, it's, it's opt-in. And the problem with that is that it just means that most towns could and maybe would opt out. So it just defeats the purpose of the good that it creates. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Please raise your hand with your uh, first name and, and location. Uh, I'm Elaine Maynard Adams. Uh, I'm a New Londoner. I'm also the chairwoman of the Board of Education in New London. And I can tell you that as of the end of the school uh, day on Friday, 11% of our student population was homeless, 11%. And for those students, we receive a grant from the federal government. It's called the McKinney-Vento Grant. The dollar amount has not changed in all of the years I have been doing this, and I've been on the board for a lot of years. It's roughly $45,000. <clears> the grant comes through in October, and by December 31st, that money is gone. The bulk of the money pays for transportation to get students from wherever they are living into school in New London. We provide where, where we, um, in cases of need, we'll buy a couple of weeks of a hotel room for, and we're not talking hotels where most of us would want to stay. We are talking about the place down off of Coleman Street that I think we probably all know about. So I, I, I fully understand the causes of homelessness are structural, they're systemic, but in the immediate today, it costs money to help these families. And 
a, an easy, I'm not gonna call it a fix, but some easy relief for us would be the federal government saying, hey, you know what, 25 years ago we gave you $45,000 to address homelessness, and you had 60 families. Today we give you $45,000 and you have 330. So if we wanna talk about making an immediate impact for some of these young people and their families, that would be a great place to start. And that starts with the school districts as well and the superintendents, number one, properly um, recording these children as homeless. That's number one to get your data accurate and correct. It also goes into when you write that grant and when you go for that, the state will also help you, all districts with those as long as they're in partnership with other community providers to make sure the services are there. So I also can see that that's, that number is large and it was everywhere for New London. But you got to also see where where's that disconnect and that gap to where what where can we do to this there's where there money that we can help build that gap from forty five thousand to what they was getting doing COVID one ninety five, right? So where can you bridge that from? And that is again reaching out to your state and then your community providers as well, but taking that time to want to do that. And that's something like on, on my end, we have pushbacks from districts who don't want to collaborate, don't want to work with us in terms of being able to provide that extra support to the students. But again, a lot of those grants are only written for education departments. So we can work with them, but we have to work within those districts. So I just urge everyone to be able to reach out to your housing and districts and be able to tell them like, you know, what can we do in terms of being able to support the youth and what other ways can we collaborate together with other community providers to be able to provide them with the support that they would need. And we brought up again the statistics in New London, the day of New London reporting that New London, Norwich and Groton are ranked as having the largest number of homeless students. Together. And that, together. You know, when I was a reporter, there was a lot of attention on when Connecticut ended homelessness among the veteran population. That was a few years ago. And I wonder where the attention is on the fact that we have children and their families that are homeless today. Does anyone have an answer to that? The attention is there. I think it's, um, I mean, they've done lots of, I mean, we've all over from state to state, special shelters, a lot of shelters have done a lot of media in terms of how many people are in their shelters. We have now we have to record da daily data on who is unhoused, who is on the street. Like that's something that we didn't do before. How many families, how many children, like that, that now goes on a portal every day now. So. Uh, the tension is there is what do we do? What do we, what do we go? What do we do from here? What do we do now? And I think that no one moves at the state level as quickly as we would like them to. Right, Kathy? Okay. <laughs> so, and they, everything is data drives their numbers, data drives their funding, da, 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 da. So, you know, they don't move as quickly as we need it to be, unfortunately. That's really, that is, a, is the issue that I can see in terms of not being able to support this, the kids at New London or Groton or wherever they're homeless is that the state hears our needs, but it takes them. I mean, it took me 10 years to get windows. So, I mean, it's just <laughs> they don't move at the pace that the needs are. Margaret, did you want to add to that? Yes. Um, On the microphone? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it would help. Um, yes. Um, as Shonda had said, like I sit at her meetings um, that she has, and we get all the, da the data from from what she was able to report to us and and from other towns around um, in, in our county that should come to the meeting. And I, I think that for me, um, being hands-on with a lot of the families like in, our, in New London specifically that are, um, are really struggling with um, just food security in a hotel. Um, you can't cook in a hotel. You have a microwave and you got a refrigerator. You know, um, there's not that ability to, um, to even have a washer and dryer to have clean clothes like you should, or you would like to. So those are the things also that go along with that. And and I think with, when Sean is speaking to the um, the 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 fullness of of families and what's not being seen um, even at the school level, um, the reports that she even gets, 
um, from the 18 to 24 years old. Let's let's even go there. We're talking about youth and adolescents and, and even elementary school, but there's an 18 to 24 year old group of, 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 of youth that we don't even get a chance to really see in the forefront. We see them, but we don't realize what their needs are. And they're being counted, but they're not being counted with that same number of them. Of, um, high school or um, high school students that are there. And some of them might be college students. They're still students, you know? And, and I remember um, at one point when I was in Bridgeport, I'll use that as an example, the students would come to the shelter and stay there for the summer and go back to school during the dorm time of the school season, you know? The, um, yeah, so, and they were still homeless. Yeah, yeah, they were, and that was years ago, but they, that's what they, they, were, they were able to do. and. And that until they finished and graduated, so. They said they can't do that anymore. No, can't do that anymore. So that's not a thing. We are we're facing one of that. We're going to be facing that issue um, this coming up. We have a one graduate from New London High that's going to go off to college, and um, we are figuring a way to be creative, doing break and summers off. So, but yes, no, can't do that anymore. There's a question in the, oh, there's one in the back and then also one in the front, uh, Shannon. Uh, Susan Ayers Stonington. First of all, let me thank you all for your dedication to help the people as you do. Just really beautiful to, to witness. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to ask this question. How do we work with our landlords to make their property safe and healthy, especially in terms of the mold problem? Because many of our children suffer from asthma, right? <laughs> well, according, the report has to come in from the individual themselves, the, the, the rentee. Um, so um, one of those things is there has to be the sanitarians have to go out and make sure it's safe. And, and you know, once the, they, actually, when you find one thing, like mold, you find more than one thing. <laughs> um, and that's what often happens in some of these situations. So um, working with them, we do, the health department does work closely with them. They do have a, a, a way of the sanitarians go out and we'll work with them, even with the lead in, in the apartments for uh, children that are under a certain age um, and making sure that the doctors are connected with the sanitarians at the Ledger Light Health District. They keep track of all that. Um, and if there is a lead exposure, our sanitarians are very up on top of following that child through with um, what is necessary with the pediatricians. Um, all, same thing with mold. Same thing with mold. So they do work with the landlords. If, if someone calls and reports it, it will definitely be um, something that legislate would get on right away with their sanitarian team. We have a question in the front, Shannon. Can I jump in? Sure. Real quick, just to Susan's question as well. I, I think. Uh, the one word that I think of is visibility. Um, us as a housing counseling agency, we need to do a better job with our marketing scheme and letting folks know that we're out there uh, in the event that there are housing complaints, housing issues, we wanna be able to serve you and assist you, kind of really guide you to the right resources, which would either be the city or to like Ledgelite. Thank you, Chris from New London. Um, I appreciate this discussion. I think it's incredibly invaluable. And I just had a couple questions around holding local officials accountable. Um, so I thought that building some affordable housing was a requirement of municipalities. I thought some of the funding that New London, uh, or maybe not, I thought that some of the new, like the beam, the docks, whatever it's called, I thought some of that had to be affordable, but somehow New London got around. No, so what's affordable is really not affordable, okay? so. They're called tax credited properties. So you have to earn a certain income to get in there to get that base rent. So I gave you an example, say like Carabetta, that's on Coleman. So when they took over, that used to be a housing authority, they came in, bought them, right? So you have to have like a family of two. On a, these numbers aren't accurate, but say they have to be between 14, they have to earn between 14,000 and 17,000 to get that $450 rent, right? And you can't make a dollar over that. Are you not eligible? Okay, then you have to make between like eighteen thousand and twenty-five thousand to get that thousand-dollar rent. You have to make between twenty-five thousand as much to get that fifteen hundred-dollar rent. That's what they call affordable. Okay, so let me make this clear. So like Oak Tree, that's out in in um, Georgia City. So you cannot work a full-time job at McDonald's with two kids and afford their 
affordability crack. You can you can't. So it's all about it's how they see it is just like that's what they call affordable housing. So you have to fit this box, or this box, or that box, and then you can't have nothing, in, nothing in your right, nothing in your record. Like you can't owe nobody, you can't have no evictions, you can't, you nothing. So truly affordable. So there is no requirement for truly affordable housing. That municipalities have to build. They so just have to say that they're gonna. That's what they call affordable housing. That tax credit. They're gonna okay. give them a, ta a credit off their taxes. But they're forced to, to live in poverty you, to get the credit. Yeah. So you're gonna rent to ten ten percent of your units are gonna be a, affordable housing. So if their affordable ha housing is a thousand dollars, but you have to earn a person for me to apply for that, I have to earn between this bracket to get it, and to be able to get that piece of that quote unquote okay. affordable housing. And the fair rent you were talking about, Mr. Is it Errol? Yes. Um, is that something that local, like city council and the mayor, could implement or not? It's at a state level. Uh, you're talking about a state a rent level. Cap. Uh, local municipalities, we don't cap rents in Connecticut. So if anything, it's just mostly just. It's really a suggestion. It's a guideline. It's a, it's a so guideline saying, to follow. A municipality couldn't do it. It would have to be at the state level, and it, it would yeah. just be a recommendation. It, it would have to be a state level, if, if anything, to cap rents. I mean, you can go to Fair Rent Commission uh, and make that complaint. Our office does assist you with that, and there's a negotiation. There's some form of a mediation, which may assist you in kind of maybe reducing that rent or maybe finding some kind of happy mean. Uh, but, yeah, until we start capping rents, yeah, there's really nothing that we can do. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, my name is Erin Wilkler. I'm a resident and parent and education consultant in the city of New London. And to kind of go off of what Chris was just asking you and again what um, you guys were talking about in terms of collaborating and working together, I'm curious with this being such a major issue and concern for people in Connecticut in general, but most mostly in the, what was it, New London, Groton, and Norwich? Um, how often are our local governments and legislative members interacting with you guys to see what's going on, what these numbers are, what our needs are as a community? Because I feel like listening to what you guys are doing, you're doing what you can, but really nothing can be done until it goes up at a higher level. So how much are they interacting with you to get feedback to see what really we need as a community? You want the honest answer? Never. Yeah. Never. When there's a problem. Yeah. When there's a major problem, like the folks over in Ivy Court and Groton, when you have 30 families that are being impacted, that's when folks are getting involved, when stuff, you can use the word stuff, uh, kind of really hits the fan. That's when they get involved. Yeah. Shonda? And that's true. And yeah, it doesn't, and then even then, it's like, it's on the news for today, it's gone two days from now. So it's, it's like, it's not even something that they consider to be, because I think what I can say more is like, holding them accountable to the agreements that they make with these developers, right? That's what we talk about, zoning meetings, things of that nature. What, if, what is a town agreeing to? So when they agree to allow someone to come and build this building over here on and cost eighteen hundred dollars for their one bed. Like, what what did the town agree to? Like, what was their stipulations to their building, and and who's holding them accountable for whatever they agreed to? And that's that's just any that's any town around. It's like, so if they agree to these things, like, who is there to hold them accountable for it? I lied. I'll take one more question in the back. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Oh, Lord. Wow. Um, my name is Maya Shepard. I'm a New London resident. I'm also the executive director of Hearing Youth Voices. And I'm so glad that you asked that question. I think like it's important to ground in the fact that besides Elaine, not a single elected official is here tonight. And this is a crisis in our community. So I think the answer, that's the answer, right? Um, I also think like this isn't really a question. Oh, maybe there's, there's one, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, hi, two, 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 um, which there, there's a lot more than two, so 
point proven. Um, I also just want to say, like, I have a question and a thought, which is, like, there are actually local actions happening right now. Step Up New London is in the building, running a housing campaign in New London, right, supporting folks in Groton. And, like, if, if all of us who are residents of this place and the places around it don't show up for those efforts, this will continue. I also wonder, like, what is stopping us from people who are here tonight and who care from from going to our state and saying, why can't we cap rent the way we did in 2020, right? And we were really close to making it happen. So I just like, it's not really a question, it's sort of a, a call to all of us and like a sort of like what y'all thoughts are, like what is stopping us from saying enough, this is a real crisis and it can't go any further. Margaret? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Maya, um, for bringing up that that advocacy in always the things that you're doing, especially when it comes to these causes in our community. Um, you know, it's, I think I'll say one thing, we have been working, Errol and I have been working the past couple of days with families um, and also Shonda, when we get calls, we all get together. We all come collaboratively, we know who to turn to, we know who the resources are. But to your point there is yes, what can we do? We have to be able to reach out as, as well. Um, as agencies working and getting the phone calls and letting other community members know what's really taking place. Step Up has been doing some great work with Fair Housing and bringing some wonderful um, conversations together at OIC um, and educating um, our community on what they can do. And, and again, that brought people to call Ledge Light based on what was necessary for them um, as their needs were being, um, being seen and met for apartments that have been totally um, unlivable, uh, uninhabitable, as we would say, as we would not call safe and affordable. Um, so that's what we have to do. We, what is stopping us? And what is, there really shouldn't be anything that's stopping us from doing that. You're right, Maya. There shouldn't be anything that we should all come together and put together something that would be uh, robust in, um, in our communities, especially. I have to say, there's, it saddens me to see that um, the, the I'm gonna say gentrification that's taking place in New London. I'm just gonna say it. Um, I'm gonna say it. And um, Shore Street has become, um, I was just talking to one of our audience members about, there was a code, I'm gonna say it. There was a code at one time um, for our black families that we understood that housing was so important to us. And um, if the landlord was a black landlord, okay, um, there was an opportunity to negotiate. There's not a lot of black landlords in our community, but there's not a lot of black home ownership for individuals to be purchasing homes and then renting them out. And that's one of the things I'm gonna say and be stand on because I really believe that's one thing that hasn't been available to our black families to be able to build multifamily homes that could be investments for them and have other black families and people with brown and brown skin, black and brown skin to, to, to rent and see it in a different view. Um, because there was a code at one time um, that, you know, we keep this between ourselves and uh, we'll make this work. But that slowly diminished as investment investors came in and, and the Mason-Dixon line in New London got moved, I'm going to say it in that way. And, um, and, that, and now we're, this is where we are today. And we have more people moving, coming into our town. We have more people coming into our town that are from other countries that are needing housing as well. Um, and they can't afford it either, you know, so. So that call to action is important, but we don't wanna leave people here without hope. There's gotta be some bright lights and the three of you and your reporting, Sabrina, are part of that. Uh, Errol, do you wanna leave us with um, a success story that, that we can think about in terms of how the community comes together? Uh, most definitely. I mean, if anything, just uh, some of the advocacy that we've been doing, uh, Margaret, myself, uh, working with some of our seniors. You know, some of our seniors have lived 30, 40 years in the same community, have paid rents of nine fifty, a thousand dollars $1,000. They're being charged $1,800, $2,000 on a fixed income. Uh, when they come to us, we do our best to kind of really advocate for those folks. And when they win those cases, they feel like they win the lottery. So, I mean, it takes advocacy, it takes collaboration, and it starts with all of us. 
I want to thank Errol Maurice, Margaret Lancaster, Shonda Easley, and Sabrina Buckwalter for joining us tonight. Again, that documentary that Sabrina's working on for Connecticut Public premiering June 27th, and we'd love to, to come back to New London to screen that. I want to thank all of you for your great questions and your comments. Uh, we're recording this conversation, and we'll be sure to share that um, on our website, ctpublic.org. Uh, if you click on the Engage tab, you'll see this uh, conversation. And maybe you can pass it along to other people who were un not able to come tonight. But I want to thank the Guard Arts Center and, of course, the Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union for this great partnership. Thank you.